Madam President. The Senator from Missouri. I want to first of all follow up on a comment my friend from, uh, Louis, uh, from um, Alabama just made on Social Security and Medicare. I think it's very important that we listen carefully to what he just had to say. That if we do things that are so-called reforms, and I think there are many places where we could reform those programs, we should use those savings to save those programs. Uh, we shouldn't say we're going to have reforms in Medicare, more likely perhaps right away than Social Security, and then not use those reforms to extend the life of these important programs. These are programs that we have told Americans in the case of Social Security since the early, since the mid-1930s, in the case of Medicare since the mid-1960s, that you'd be able to rely on. And we see that those programs can be extended, they can be adjusted, they can be reformed, but I think uh, the, the, our leader on our side of the budget effort who spends so much time trying to make the case for the right kind of budget decisions is clearly pointing out that if you make savings in these programs and then use that money to fund other discretionary spending, is that the fair thing to do with Social Security or Medicare? I, I don't think so, and I think he's raising a very good point here and as we try to figure out how to move forward in this year, uh, we need to be sure that savings are real savings, that they're not double counted, that we're not saving money in one program that clearly uh, should go toward that priority of that program rather than the other priorities we haven't yet set. Which gets me to the topic of, of, of setting priorities. You know, we had the the opportunity to go to the White House, uh, Democrats yesterday, Republicans today, to talk to the president about how we move forward with the budget year, the spending year that's already started. Uh, and uh, when we were there, the president made it clear uh, once again that we shouldn't negotiate, but on more than one occasion in the morning that we were there, the president said, uh, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be allowed to negotiate for things that you couldn't get or didn't get in the regular process. And my view of that, Madam President, is there is no regular process. Uh, as the President said that, I, I, I thought, uh, uh, th this is like pouring gas on a fire of frustration for members of the Senate, particularly in the House, that are frustrated that there is no process, there is no place earlier than a crisis to go and say, let's debate these issues, let's debate these priorities. How many of the 12 spending bills for the year that began 11 days ago have we had on the floor of the Senate? One. One of the bills that should have been done starting at about last, uh, last March and April, that should have been completed over the summer, that money would have been spent beginning October 1, None, one of the 12 was on the floor and frankly, it was a bill that the, the majority leader had every reason to believe wouldn't pass if it was brought to the floor. But let's, let's not even go there. Let's assume it would have passed. It still would have just been one of the 12 bills that we need to run the government. So when the president or anybody else says you shouldn't use these crisis moments to try to get your priorities discussed, they're the only moments we have. They're the only time we have. I don't like government by crisis. I think it's a very unfortunate thing for this presidency that in, in, if you really look at how the government has worked in the last five years, it's from one crisis to another. And if I could do anything to help President Obama pull away from his crisis management, I'd be inclined to want to try to do that particularly if pulling away from crisis management meant that we were going to come back and have a fair debate between a divided Congress that leads to some way forward that can, can actually accomplish something. The idea that uh, uh, we won't negotiate at this moment or the president feeling that somehow he won't be held hostage to uh, the debt limit, I'm certainly going to vote tomorrow not to even move forward with this discussion for a $1 trillion uh, debt ceiling increase with no discussion of what we're going to do to change our behavior. You know, President Obama, to his credit, 
entered into a negotiation uh, just uh, two years ago, August of 2011, and in return for uh, one, uh, two and a half trillion dollars worth of spending cuts uh, over a decade, he got $2.1 trillion in additional debt ceiling. Now, the, the president can't uh, agree to that in August of 2011, and then in, 2000, in, in uh, October of 2012 say, nobody should ever negotiate on the debt ceiling. 53 times uh, in the, since 1978, we've had a change in the debt ceiling, and since 1978, more than half of those debt limits uh, included legislation dealing with either spending or other matters. This is not, this, the, the, the president says, I will not be, put this on future presidents to be the president that goes forward with increasing the debt ceiling uh, under some, because, with a negotiation. Well, every president since 1978 has had the same situation the president had in August of 2011, the same situation, Madam President, you and I would have if we were gonna go get our line of credit extended and we'd exceeded our line of credit, whoever's gonna extend that line of credit is gonna say, okay, what are you gonna to do to change the behavior that you have that allowed you to blow through your last line of credit? Uh, and the president and others will say, well, this is about America paying its bills. This is about, we want the Congress, the current Congress, to pay the bills it has incurred. Well, most of the bills that have been incurred weren't incurred by this Congress. They were incurred by past legislation. 62% of the spending uh, is now, in, in last year, it'll probably be higher the year we're in at this moment, 62% of the spending was mandatory spending. It was uh, spending that was put in place by Congress's beginning in the 1930s through uh, the uh, health care bill. That's mostly mandatory spending. The current Congress didn't get to vote on the health care bill, but more importantly, most of the current Congress wasn't alive when the, uh, uh, when the Social Security Act passed. Many of the members of, this, of the Congress and even some of the members of the Senate weren't alive when Medicare passed. Uh, this is the time to look at, for this Congress, to look at those pieces of legislation and say, what do we need to do to adjust them to the future needs of the country? What do we need to do to adjust them to the current and future demographic realities of society? People live longer. People need these services longer. What do we do to make this work in a way that these programs can last? These are not programs put in place by this Congress. These are not bills incurred by this Congress. These are bills, in fact, that this Congress and this president can decide we're going to look at these programs and be sure they last and look at these programs and be sure they can be paid for. And that's exactly the kind of discussion we should be having when we ask the American people through their Congress to extend the line of credit. The idea that we won't negotiate on, uh, on the debt ceiling or we won't negotiate on how to spend the money, uh, if we don't negotiate on how to spend the money by bringing the appropriations bills to the floor, how are we supposed to negotiate and set priorities and let democracy work? I don't like democracy by crisis. And whatever we do in the next few weeks or months that it takes to finish out the year we've already started, what we should all do is commit ourselves for the year that begins next October 1 to be prepared for that, like the Congress until just uh, uh, six or seven years ago generally was prepared at or near that date. And when, the, when the Congress, when there was a government shutdown in 1995, Six of the appropriations bills had been passed, signed into law, and all those parts of the government were working after a debate that provided funding. And so I would just say, Madam President, as I conclude, uh, that we need to move away from management by crisis, but we also need to understand that if we don't do the work the regular way, there's no other place to take a stand. There's no other place to have this debate. 
the president's sense that you could get this at some other point, there is no other point if the Congress and the president aren't doing their job. And I would just say we should do our job. Uh, we should do it in, the, in a way that people can see. We should do it in the, 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 the small bites that uh, the budget process is set up to allow us to look at and debate. We haven't done that over the last 12 months. We're gonna have, we're gonna, we've started this year in about the worst possible way. Uh, hopefully we'll get through this and then resolve to do the work the right way for, the, for what begins a year from now. But at this moment, the president thinking that we can just go ahead and move forward without negotiating, I think is a, is a wrong decision on the president's part and I would uh, yield the floor.